Hey guys, so this video is on wave particle duality and line spectra. So we're going to start with wave particle duality, and this comes from a, a guy named de Broglie, um, who was thinking about this, this kind of stuff back then, and he said that, well, we know that light, um, which we know acts like a wave, can also act like a particle, because it can act like a photon, that's a photoelectric effect, and, and a wave, that's um, constructive and destructive interference then maybe particles, and he was thinking in particular about electrons and atoms, can act like waves. Because at, up to this point, um, scientists thought about electrons as strictly particles, because they certainly do act as if they are particles. And Broglie said that, well, what if the electrons and atoms um, act also act like standing waves? Now, to understand what a standing wave is, if we look at this picture of a guitar over here, in order for a... a um, string to make a sound when you, when you pluck it or strike it, um, the length of that string um, must equal uh, some integral multiple of a half wavelength because if the length of the string is one half wavelength then we have what's called a node at either end and we get a standing wave that continues to, to oscillate and continues to make a tone. If we have the length of the strength, string being two half wavelengths we have um, three nodes, one on each end plus one in the middle, and we get a standing wave. If we have um, the length of the string being three half wavelengths, then we get four nodes and we get a standing wave. Um, so <clears throat> to understand why this is, if we imagine that string being um, looped into a circle and plucked, and then if the the um, that length of that string, it ends up that the criteria is down here. If it's if it's the two pi times the radius of that string is equal to, or the circumference is equal to some integer times the wavelength, then the ends of the wave overlap and it's a standing wave and it maintains itself. Um, if that's not true, if this condition here is not true, then the ends do not overlap and they end up canceling out real quickly. But that's destructive interference. So, de Broglie was also thinking about Einstein's famous e equals mc squared, squared equation. If, in the last video, remember, we, we showed that, or how Einstein showed, that for a photon, the relativistic mass is equal to Planck's constant over the wavelength of that photon, lambda, times c, the speed of light. What de Broglie said is, well, what if this is true for any particle, the only difference being because any particle is not electromagnetic radiation, the speed is not the speed of light in the vacuum, but rather whatever the speed of that particle is, called v, velocity. If you rearrange this little equation a little bit, you get lambda equals h over mv. And that says that lambda, which is the wavelength, is equal to Planck's constant over the mass times the velocity. And this equation, guys, applies to any particle, any particle at all. Um, and this wavelength is called the de Broglie wavelength for that particle with mass m moving at velocity v. So for example, let's calculate the de Broglie wavelength of a helium atom, and this is the mass in kilograms of a helium atom that's traveling at you know, 3,141 meters per second. So if we plug those values in to the um, de Broglie equation, Planck's constant right here, that mass, velocity there, remember, joules is kilograms meters squared per second squared, and so the units do work out we get a wavelength of about 3.174 times 10 to the minus 11th meters. It ends up, that's almost exactly the, um, the radius of a helium atom. So it's, um, it's definitely a detectable wavelength. We have light gamma rays probably that can get down into that range. And so this is something that we can actually detect. Um, now let's do the same calculation though for a baseball, okay? So a professional baseball uh, mass is about 149 grams. Let's say, you know, a real good pitcher throws at about 94 miles per hour, which is 42.2 meters per second. Let's calculate that de Broglie wavelength. So we plug into de Broglie's equation, Planck's constant over the mass, remember that has to be in kilograms, um, times the velocity, and we get 1.05 times 10 to the minus 34th meters. That, guys, is incredibly small. There's no way we can even come close to measuring that or seeing that. So even though um, theoretically it does have a wavelength, it's not something that's that we're going to be able to detect at least detect at least anytime soon. So the next phenomena that um, led to our current understanding of quantum mechanics was line spectra. 
Um, now, this is another of those um, phenomena that scientists were trying to explain back then, and they couldn't. And their, their um, attempts to explain it led to our current um, understanding of quantum mechanics. So what happens in a line spectra is if you have what's called a gas discharge tube. And this is just simply a, a, gas, uh, excuse me, a glass tube that's sealed and evacuated. And then, you know, so there's no air in there, and then it's filled with one particular gas. It could be any gas. Hydrogen, sodium, neon, xenon, xenon, what have you. And then there's two electrodes in here. So basically you, you plug it into a wall, right? There's one electrode here and one electrode here. And so an electric current, a high voltage electric current, um, travels through the gas. Okay? And when it does, this gas gives off a glow. Um, if you look at neon lights, that's exactly what they are. Just this, but built in, bent, bent into different shapes. Now, if we take that get, that glow, that light, it's given off, shine it through a slit to collimate it, and then pass the, that collimated beam through a prism. What all the prism does is it breaks that light into its <clears throat> component wavelengths. Remember, a wavelength determines the color. And what we see is that the light that's coming out of this gas discharge tube only has certain wavelengths in it. This, the, when we show those wavelengths, that's called a line spectrum. <clears throat> And that did not fit with their current understanding of the way things work. Because what they expected was a continuous spectrum, all the colors of the rainbow, right? So, you know, from you know, all the way through, but they didn't. Now, the, the values of the wavelengths that we, of light that we did, do see depends upon the gas. Different gases have a characteristic spectrum. As a matter of fact, astronomers use it today to determine what um, elements are way, way out in space. They do a line spectrum. So they couldn't explain this. And then this guy named Johann Balmer came along and he discovered what's called the Rydberg equation. When I say discovered it, it means that he basically um, tried to f f find a, an equation that um, fit the data. So it's empirical. It's just he's playing with numbers and trying to get something that, that works. And he found this. The one over the wavelength of the light that's emitted is equal to some constant called the Rydberg constant. That's what this is right here, times 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. Now, um, where the n's are just any integer, positive integers were, but n2 has to be greater than n1. Um, and this is just a constant. Don't bother memorizing it. We're gonna, and don't even bother memorizing this qu equation because we're gonna get a better one in just a minute. Um, but this was a, a major leap forward because what this says is what this does is this quantizes the, the wavelength of light that can come out of the, the gas discharge tube. And remember, wavelength of photons is, is related to their energy equals hc over lambda, which means that the energy is quantized. By quantized, I mean because these ends can only have certain values, they're integers, one, two, three, four, etc. The value of the wavelength can only have certain values. And that means the energy of the light that's coming out of the gas discharge can only have certain discrete values. That was that was radical for that time. That was there was it caused a lot of uproar. But you know you can't argue with the data. Then along came Niels Bohr, this guy right over here, and he okay so um, Bomber was, Bomber's result was empirical. He just played with the numbers and got an equation. Bohr came up with a theory. Um, so this is Bohr's theory. He proposed that in an atom, okay, if this over here is the nucleus with its positive charge or positive charges, what he said, and this was very radical for the time, that what if the electrons can only exist at certain distances from outside, you know, away from the nucleus. He called those n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, and n equals 4. You see what, what uh, Bohr is saying is that an electron can exist here, or it can exist here, or here, or here, or here, but never exist anywhere in between. However, he said the electrons can, can transition between these energy levels. Now, um, what? Okay, so what that what that shows us, or what that tells us, if if it's true and it works, is that because the closer an electron with its negative charge is to the positively charged nucleus the lower its energy. The farther away it is, the higher its energy. And so if we, if an electron f 
falls down from a, a higher end, say out here, to a lower end, say you know n equals 5 to n equals 2, then now it has less energy once it's fallen down to the lower end. Where did the energy go? We know from the law of conservation of energy that it, it can't just disappear. It ends up that a photon is created. It creates a photon, and the energy of that photon is exactly equal to the difference in energy of the electron up here and down here. Because we know the energy, we know the wavelength. So this, this transition gives a specific color light, specific wavelength of light. And because the electrons can only exist at certain distances from the nucleus, when they fall down, they can only give off light of specific wavelengths. Now it works the other way too, guys. Um, if we have an electron just sitting, um, these are called orbits, sitting in an orbit around the nucleus, and we put some energy in. There's different ways to do that. We can heat it up, black body radiation, or we can hit it with um, oh, um, electromagnetic radiation. If the that energy of that electromagnetic radiation is equal to the difference in energy of the electron at the lower energy level, orbit, and a higher energy level, that electron will absorb that photon. That, that photon's annihilated, we say. It's destroyed. The, energy, the photon's gone, and, but now the electron has more energy because it's out here somewhere. But then it does, it's not stable, it always wants to get down as close as it can to the nucleus, so it'll fall back down, and when it does, it releases a photon um, whose energy is equal to the difference in energy between the levels, the orbits. Um, and so this, this ended up working pretty well. Um, so this picture over here is trying to show, trying to simplify um, this picture over here. Each of these lines represents an orbit, n equals 1, n equals 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. And this is showing an electron going from n equals 3 falling to n equals 2, 4 to 2, 5 to 2. They could also go from 2 to 1, 5 to 1, etc. Okay. Um, and so this fit with line spectra very well. Um, and Bohr, was, Bohr came up with an equation. Based on his theory, he derived this equation. Um, it looks pretty similar to um, um, the Bomber equation. Um, um, the Rydberg equation that Bomber came up with, um, but this was he. If, this comes from theory rather than empirical. So what Bohr's theory says, Bohr's equation says that the difference in energy of that electron when it when it moves between two orbits or energy levels is equal to negative 2.178 times 10 to the minus 18th joules times z squared. I'll tell you what all this stuff means in a minute. Times one over the final n squared minus one over the initial n squared n is an integer, okay, so what do these mean? n is an integer, and it's, it describes the orbit, you know, that picture that I just showed you, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or more, okay, n can go out to infinity. Um, z is the number of protons in the nucleus, it's the atomic number for that nucleus, the number of protons. So the delta E electron, that's the change in energy of the electron. Now this can be positive or negative, because now, um, Okay, because if n final is less than n initial, so we're maybe going from n equals 4 down to n equals 3, um, and n final is yeah, greater, greater than n initial, then that means that we have um, a inside of here, this is a positive number which means this negative sign makes the change in energy of the electron negative. So the electron loses energy. And that's what has to happen if it goes from higher energy to a lower energy. On the other hand, if n final is less than n initial, then it's going maybe from 2 up to 7 or something. Now, that gives a negative inside of here. This negative makes the overall um, value of this side of the equation positive and the change in energy of the electron is positive, which it must be if it goes from lower energy to a higher energy. Um, now, when this happens, okay, okay, so we're thinking about the um, difference in energy going into or coming from photons, electromagnetic radiation. So the change in energy of the electron is equal to negative energy of the photon, conservation of energy. So if the change in energy of the electron is negative, okay, then the energy of the photon is positive. 
but if the change in energy of the electron is positive, that means the energy of the photon is negative. Now, all that means if we get a negative um, energy for the photon is that it just means that energy was destroyed, annihilated, right? Um, excuse me, not energy, that, that photon was annihilated. And the energy of the photon before it was annihilated was positive. You can't have a negative energy of a photon that exists. And so what we say is that, um, well, we use the equation that we saw before, energy of a photon is equal to h nu or hc over lambda. So guys, what we do is we can calculate, if we can calculate the change in energy of the electron, um, and again, if we get, um, so that gives us the energy of the photon, and if the pho and photon's energy is negative, that just means it was annihilated, that's all. Um, if it's positive, that means um, it was created. So the energy of the photon that we get this way is gonna be positive if the electron goes from a higher end to a lower end, so it creates a photon, it actually creates it. Um, if, it's, if the energy of the photon is negative, then the photon that hits the, now what's happening in that case is the photon is hitting the electron in the atom, the photon is annihilated, the electron gains that energy and moves up to a higher energy, a higher orbit in the atom. Um, now, one caveat here, and this is really important, this equation, Bohr's equation, only works for hydrogen-like atoms. It's a major restriction, but it's also a major step forward in our understanding. Um, so that's what is, so what does hydrogen-like mean? It means that any atom or ion that has only one electron. So if it's hydrogen, then Z is one. There's one proton, and you know, we don't have to worry about it. But if let's say it's the um, helium plus, HE plus, okay? Helium has two protons, so Z is two. HE plus lost one of its electrons, so it has one electron. Um, lithium with a positive two charge works here. Now Z is three, and so on. So there's um, Bohr's equation. Um, Make sure you know this one, guys. Put it on your cards. Make sure you know what everything means here. So let's do an example. Um, let's calculate the wavelength in nanometers of a photon that's absorbed. So that means it's going to be annihilated, um, which causes an electron in the helium plus atom to go from n equals 2 to n equals 5. So it's going from a lower energy to a higher energy. Um, so why don't you guys go ahead and give this a shot and come on back when you get an answer. Welcome back. So Plugging into Bohr's equation, right here, Z is two because it's helium, um, and final is five and initial is two. So plugging those numbers in here, um, we get um, a positive number for delta E of the electron because it gained energy. It went from low n equals two to n equal positive higher higher energy n equals five. We got one about one point eight three or 295 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. So now to get the, the wavelength of the photon that's absorbed, annihilated, it's the energy of the photon is negative delta E of the electron. So we get energy of the photon is negative 1.8295 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. And again, the negative just means that that photon was annihilated. And what we really want is the energy of the photon before it was annihilated, which is positive of this number. So we use, so now we use E equals HC over lambda, solve for lambda, so lambda, the wavelength of that photon is equal to HC over its energy, the energy of the photon. So we plug in H, Planck's constant, C, the speed of light, the energy of the photon we just calculated, and we get this, um, this wavelength, 1.0857 times 10 to the minus 7th meters, and we were just asked for it in nanometers, so we just convert to nanometers and we get 108.6 nanometers. And that's all there is to it, guys.